Hello, I'm Igor Borghi, and I have the privilege to lead the gynecological health business at Medtronic, and I'm really happy to welcome you to this webinar this evening. Uh, this evening, I have with me my colleague, Niall Fai, who is responsible for the medical affair uh, for gynecological health to Western Europe, and Professor Attilio Di Spezio Sardo from Policlinico Federico II in Naples, who will drive us through his office hysteroscopy uh, practice in Naples. So it's a great opportunity for all of us to learn how he set his uh, practice, and he will share with us all tips and tricks for a successful office hysteroscopic procedures. Uh, I want to just ask you that the idea for this webinar is to have a lot of interaction. So please uh, submit your question in the Q&A session. And after, at the end of the session, uh, Professor Attilio Di Spezio Sardo will be happy to answer all the questions we have. So thank you very much. And I hope you will enjoy this webinar. So now, Professor Di Spezio Sardo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much and welcome. Hi, Igor. Hi, Niall. First of all, thanks to IRCAD for all the technical support. And thanks, Niall and Igor, for having arranged this webinar. Everyone would love to have in vivo courses, and probably we are moving towards this direction. But in the meanwhile, this webinar have taught that we can learn something even if we are at distance. And I hope that at the end of my talk, at least you will find a lot of enthusiasm inside yourself to start or to continue your office practice. I'm going now to share my screen. And today we will do a journey that is not going to last one hour because I want to give much space for the interaction, as Igor Borghi said before, in order to show how I was able to build up an office uh, ambulatory uh, hysteroscopy setting in my unit in Naples in the south of Italy. So first of all, we have to speak the same language because probably the word office, the word outpatient, ambulatory, are not used in the proper way. This is the reason why during COVID pandemic, when we had more time to work on scientific activities, five experts from ESGE with five experts of AGL and five experts of the global community of hysteroscopy decided to join together because we realized that we need to have a standardized nomenclature in hysteroscopy. And the results of this uh, joint convention was two papers published, the same paper, but published on JMIC, which is the official journal of the AGL, and the paper on facts, view, and vision in Obsengaini, which is the official journal of the European Society of Gynecological Endoscopy. Basically, we have decided that in order to standardize terminology for hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy should be classified on the base of five domains, pain management, setting, the model of care, the type of procedures, and even the approach of procedure. Basically, one of the main limiting factor of the widespread diffusion of hysteroscopy all over the world is pain, mostly for the patient when, for the procedure when the patient is awake. And we know that we have several levels of pain management, ranging from level one, no medication, 
or just the use of oral medication, but non-sedative ones, up to the level five, which is general anesthesia. On the basis of the level of pain management that you offer your patients during hysteroscopy, you can have an office hysteroscopy. So an office hysteroscopy is an hysteroscopic procedure which is performed in a medical practitioner's professional premises where you can offer to your lady a pain control up to level 3A. And so coming back to the uh, previous slide, 3A means that you can even do in your office setting oral or inhalational medication with a sedative effect. So office does not mean that as we normally do in Naples, for example, we don't use any kind of medication, but it's still office if you can prescribe, if you can administrate to your patient in this setting, oral or inhalational medication with sedative effect. The difference between office and outpatient is not on the base of the level of pain management that you can offer, because you see, it's the same pain control up to level 3A. The difference is that when we speak about outpatient clinic hysteroscopy, the procedure is performed in an healthcare facility for the management of outpatients. So it can be an hospital, a community clinic, or even a freestanding surgical center. So basically, so the best way to define what I'm going to show you today I do outpatient clinic hysteroscopy because, as you see, my ambulatory is within an hospital, the University Federico II of Naples, which is able to manage, of course, outpatient procedures. So basically, we have to use the correct terminology. So it's not an office hysteroscopy, but an outpatient clinic hysteroscopy. And I will show you in this talk what is really possible in 2022 with the proper instrumentation, with proper experience and skill, what is really possible to be performed in an outpatient setting. This is my uh, setting in the University Federico II of Naples. And we normally do what we call see and treat hysteroscopy. And even for this concept, there is a small differentiation between what we call office operative hysteroscopy with see and treat hysteroscopy. Office operative hysteroscopy or outpatient operative hysteroscopy, if you perform within the hospital, it means that you first do a diagnostic step that it's a diagnostic hysteroscopy, or in many centers, it's only sonographic diagnosis, then you can discriminate between the pathology that can be performed in the same setting of your diagnostic step, and most of them are minor procedures, or you can discriminate those pathology that will be treated in inpatient setting generally in an operating room setting. So we perform diagnosis and treatment both in outpatient setting, but not in the same step. Differently from this approach is what we do in Naples, see and treat. We do in the same setting, in the same moment, both phases of our approach to our patients, diagnosis and treatment. We first do diagnosis and then with the same hysteroscope or even changing the hysteroscope, but without, I mean, changing uh, the setting or saying to the patients to come after uh, an hour or in another day, immediately after the diagnostic phase, we perform the operative part. This is the real CN treat. And please, let me thank all my group of young and less young doctors, but you see that all of them are, luckily for them, very young, 29 years old on the average. And thanks to all my group, we can perform 
nearly 2,500 hysteroscopy per year. We didn't stop even during COVID pandemic. We continue to do emergency oncological cases, uh, hysteroscopy before the plain IVF. And so we maintain a very high number of hysteroscopy. We do an average of 20, 25 hysteroscopy per day. If some of you uh, had time and uh, possibility to spend some days in my unit, you could, you could confirm that is real what I'm saying. But if you don't believe me, you will be welcome in my unit. And you will see that if you have a proper setup, and I will show you after many years, the setup that we have built up in my unit, we can perform a large number of hysteroscopy per day, five days per week. And most of these procedures are operative. And even if I'm not present, my assistants are even better than me. We are a group of 15 operators and my young assistant as Chiara, Brunella, Alessandro, Alfonso are able to perform hysteroscopy even if I'm not present in my unit. After this introduction on the nomenclature, because it's very important, because the prerequisite to compare the setting, the procedures, the data is to speak the same language, we come to the most interesting part of my talk, how to set up a, a good uh, setting for our outpatient operative hysteroscopy. First of all, we need a dedicated room. So I, my ambulatory few years ago was defined by uh, Carl Storz who developed all this ambulatory system one of the most advanced center in Europe, but you know, technology does many improvements throughout the years. You know that uh, the technology uh, did great improvements in the last years. And you know that currently probably the most advanced outpatient setting is what they have in Rome, but my previous fellow, now master Ursula Catena Gemelli, uh, with the hysteroscopy digital clinic, but even before, but our hysteroscopy guru, Rudy Campo in Leven, Belgium, and then by my friend, uh, Giuseppe Bigatti in Shanghai. Basically, hysteroscopy digital clinic is an outpatient clinic which combines the most advanced technology in endoscopy, combined and integrated with the modern sonographic machine. Probably I was one of the first who understood the double potentiality of having both sonogra sonography machine and hysteroscopy uh, tower in the same ambulatory setting. But of course, in my unit, I'm not so rich as in Leven, Rome, or Shanghai. The, te the two technologies are not perfectly integrated, but However, we can offer our lady the possibility of a combined diagnosis by sonography and hysteroscopy, and even the possibility with sonography, mostly in case of uterine malformation, to check if the treatment that we did was complete or not, thanks to the possibility of using the high definition 3D transvaginal probes. Of course, I'm sure that all of you are thinking, but how is possible that Attilio and his group does 20, 25 procedures per day? Because we have some tips and tricks that have allowed throughout the years to speed up the process. First of all, a mobile separate, which divides the operative area by the part where my assistant or myself, when my assistants are doing the procedures, explain the procedures to the next patient and we let them to sign the consent form. And then when the first procedure is finished here, the patient goes in the bathroom and the next one is ready to be prepared, to be prepared for the next procedure. Then we have also a connection here in this table with the endo camera. So while I'm doing the procedures here, my assistant sees on the screen what is going on behind the separate and he can start to fill the report for the patients. Third tips and tricks we use in our institution chemical sterilization. 
We don't have 20 hysteroscope for Our Lady. We don't have 20 operative through clear or other operative instruments for our routine activity. But thanks to the, possi the possibility of using chemical sterilization agent, we can speed up the process because you know that with chemical agent in 10, 15 minutes, you can have a perfect uh, sterilized instruments ready to be used for the next patient. And this is the reason why we can perform with a limited number of instruments, a high number of procedures. There are some rules written and even not written that you have to follow and that we understood throughout the years. Personally, we don't ask a pregnancy test to our lady, but we schedule lady immediately after the menstrual cycle. We never say to the patients that the procedure is painless, but you know why? Because otherwise, if the patient has start to have pain or discomfort probably is the best, better term to define the feeling of the lady, the patient can start thinking that something is going wrong. So we explain perfectly the procedures that the patient can have sort of cramping pain during the procedures because we are going to distend the uterus, which is a virtual cavity. We talk to the patient before the procedure. We don't say to the patient straight away, go on the surgical chair, we do the procedure. We explain in a very detailed way what is going on in the next minutes. And then we let the patient after the explanation of the procedure to sign the consent form. So we explain the consent and then we wait that the patient read the consent and sign the consent form. Of course, some information leaflets can be very nice and very useful, but what is important and I learned from my staying at Royal Free Hospital in London many years ago, that it's very important to have a nurse or in this case is just my fellows Rosella in this video that they can reassure the patients holding the end. There is an additional monitor where the patient can see the procedure. And it's very important because the patient is reassured. And while the doctor is doing the procedure, this vocal local can reduce pain discomfort at minimum. Then it's important that you do all the procedures in vaginoscopy. Vaginoscopy has been shown to be effective, better tolerated than routine approach with speculum, tenaculum, much faster, and also increase the possible application of office hysteroscopy. And I'm very happy that Nile is going to introduce at the end of my talk an educational uh, e-learning process that Medtronic has established because vaginoscopy is mandatory in order to reduce pain discomfort of the patients at the minimum. And you have to understand that not only with the four oblique view scope, you can do vaginoscopy, but I will show you later that even when we use tissue removal device that have zero degree optic, we still use vaginoscopy in order to reduce the discomfort to, to the patient and in order to easily get into the external uterine ostium and then since then into the uterine cavity. Possibly avoid to uh, have long waiting list. Patient needs to be very motivated, but you know that ansia increase with the increase of the, the time that the patients have to wait for the procedures being performed. And then if possible, smile. Uh, if you have better smile than me, it's even better, but you know that I have a lot of uh, very nice assistants that I always very uh, unhappy when I see that some of them are not happy during our outpatient procedures in front of the patients that are very anxious. A smile counts 10,000 times more than local anesthesia, local analgesia, or the procedure itself. We cannot understand how important is that for outpatient procedure that the patient feels that the environment is very comfortable. So we have seen, I have shown you some tips and tricks to establish a proper setup 
for our outpatient diagnostic and operative procedures. Let's see now the equipment that we use. And not because this webinar has been supported by Medtronic, I'm going to say to you that I have only Medtronic stuff in my unit. When people come in my unit, they come because they want to be taught in hysteroscopy. And the beauty of this wonderful technique is that we can do the same procedures with many different instruments. What is important is not to have prejudice in confront or in regard of some uh, instruments only because they are supported by a company you are not friend of. But it's important that you understand advantages and disadvantages of all instruments. So miniaturized office operative hysteroscope, five, four, three millimeter are the basic prerequisite in order to start to perform operative procedures in outpatient setting. We always start procedures with a small diameters, continuous flow features, hysteroscope, with a diameter less than four or five millimeter, with the possibility of having an operative channel through which mechanical instrument can be inserted. In the past, when I start in 2000 to do outpatient operative hysteroscopy, mechanical instrument were all the only possibility to perform some procedures. Still now, you see that, let's see why the video does not, work now it works that you with mechanical instruments you can perform biopsy removal of dislocated iud you can perform small polypectomy few years ago i also developed some instruments specifically related for the removal of the fragment but please don't say that these instruments are fragile we know that they are very small and very fragile so you cannot think to do big operative procedures only with mechanical instruments. That's why after 1997, electrosurgical bipolar generator were developed in order to speed up the process of the operative procedures and in order to make procedures more effective. And so we understood that with mechanical instrument and with five French bipolar electrodes, we can improve the quality of our clinical activities to speed up the process, to improve the efficiency, also reducing the cost because we bring less patients to the operating room. And so we have significantly reduced the waiting list for major surgery. We have prepared with my assistant Alfonso a few days ago, this video, just to show you how it's really not very uncommon to find lady that the look this lady postmenopausal bleeding 72 years old lady now we are in march 2022 if you see the reports this lady had this problem in february 2021 she underwent a sonography where a cervical polyp was diagnosed and a thick endometrium six millimeter was diagnosed the doctor, it was right, recommended a diagnostic hysteroscopy in outpatient setting. The lady in another institution did diagnostic hysteroscopy, was on July 2021. The endometrium was atrophic. A polyp of 0.5 centimeter was detected, but what? It's honestly a blame in 2021, 22, that they recommended an operative hysteroscopy in inpatient setting in the operating room only to remove a polyp of 0.5 centimeter. The doctor, uh, the, a friend of the lady was friend of mine. He asked me after nearly one year from the first diagnosis of this lady, why Attilio, give me a favor, do an hysteroscopy to my lady in outpatient setting. So, explanation of the procedure, consent form. Uh, thanks to Alfonso. So we have edited this video in order to, to show the real time of the procedures. And you will see that in this case, for example, 
I did a diagnostic hysteroscopy. Uh, the patient is awake, no analgesia, no anesthesia. We have seen an external uterine ostium, no cervical polyp coming outside, but the cervical polyp was into the endocervical canal. Then we go inside the cavity using a novel profile hysteroscope as the Betoki is. There was also an endometrial polyp that was not diagnosed or probably was not present on July 2021. And in this case, easy procedure, small pathology using a simple five French bipolar electrodes. I removed both the endometrial polyp and then you will see the cervical polyp. So just a small cut of the pedicle of the endometrial polyp and then of the endocervical polyp. The patient is awake. You see from her eyes that little bit of discomfort is present. In this case, I didn't have someone next to the patient who can reassure during all the procedures. I had the nurse that then takes the specimen from endometrial cavity, then she collects the, the endocervical polyp. And you will see at the end of my procedures that in 19 minutes, the overall procedures was complete. So when people say that CN3 hysteroscopy is not cost effective, please don't say that because it's not real. And this patient in another institution was plain one year ago for an operative hysteroscopy in inpatient setting. So up to 2012, 2013, I only had mechanical instrument and bipolar five French instruments in my setting. And so I could do 65% of operative procedures in my outpatient setting. But I realized that mechanical instruments are very fragile. It's not very easy teaching a lot of uh, students and uh, fellows coming from all over the world that is not very easy to use the five French bipolar electrodes. It requires surgical experience. The mini resectoscope who came in the market helped a little bit more because the movement of resectoscope are more ergonomic, are easier than the use of bipolar electrodes, but you can save time thanks to the use of the mini resectoscope. But however, if you consider that we are still using electrosurgery, it means that you need proper training when you use electrosurgery is more painful than using mechanical instruments. And if you use the Betoki hysteroscope, if you use the mini resectoscope, however, you have to go in and out from the uterine cavity. And keep in mind, every time you go in and out from the uterine cavity, you change the intrauterine pressure, you stimulate the cervical innervation, and this results in pain for our lady. That's why, and not because we are here supported by Medtronic, when they first proposed me a tissue removal device, I realized, I remember my sentence to the product specialist who proposed this instrument. I said, these instruments can destroy in a positive way the market of hysteroscopy. And because I, I always believe that the main limiting factor in outpatient procedures is time. And when you have an instrument that can cut and aspirate the fragment in the same moment, I immediately thought, oh, now probably we have a perfect tool in order to reduce time of our surgery to minimum. Then, Using this instrument, we understood that probably this instrument could have many other advantages. You know, and we have to be honest that we have since 2005, many tissue removal devices that came in the market. And I think it's very important when there is no monopolio of one company in one technology then you have to know advantages and disadvantages of all the instruments available with similar characteristics in the market. Personally, I applied the technology at that time developed by Smith and Nephew because 
I wanted to use this instrument in my outpatient setting. And I told them, please give me the smallest of the family. At that time was the Truclear 5C. Then I started to use even the six millimeter, the Truclear Elite Mini. And these are the two tissue removal device that currently routinely we use in our unit because they are small. And personally, I think that the tissue removal device have their main field of application in outpatient setting because the two limiting factors are time, 90%, and pain, 10%. And pain most of the time is related to an acceptable longer time of our surgical procedures. That's why if I have an instrument that is small enough to be put into the uterine cavity without cervical dilatation, it can speed up the process. Oh, probably we have changed our approach to our lady. Of course, you have to use the proper blade for the proper pathology. If you have sometimes, I know that some, some fellow says, yes, but I use the soft tissue shaver for myoma, for fibrotic polyp, it does not work. Yes, because we are not using the proper blade for the proper pathology. So you have two possibilities, soft tissue shaver and dense tissue shaver in two forms, mini and plus because of course you can have different version of the trochlear system. Bigger is the diameter, bigger is the blade. And of course you can treat even big pathology as myoma or polyp that occupies all the uterine cavity. But if you want to concentrate on what you can do in your outpatient setting, we can perform polypectomy, smaller than one centimeter, but I would say even bigger than three centimeter, you will see in the next video, retain product of conception. And we will also explain probably a new technique that we are trying to standardize. We have tried to standardize in the last year, which is the visual DNC. But honestly, why through clear has really changed? Probably not strictly the life in hysteroscopy of senior doctors, but of young doctors. Why they are so enthusiastic when we propose to use a tissue removal device? Because in comparison with available instrument, we still do not use analgesia or anesthesia. We still do not need with the elite through clear or the 5C through clear to delay the service. But young doctors love the device because they are scared about using electrosurgery. As soon as they are inside the uterine cavity, they feel confident. They do not want to go in and out from the uterine cavity. And if you don't have to go in and out from the uterine cavity, it means that you have low risk of perforation. Because you don't use electrosurgery, you have reduced, I would say, even zero risk of post-surgical additions. You have no thermal damage on histology. The pathology will call you and say, oh, I have no artificial damage caused by electrosurgery. So we have a good specimen quality. And if you compare to the available bipolar technology, mostly when the resident are doing the procedure, the procedure is very easy rated by them. There is a shorter and faster learning curve. Basically, you have just to put the blade close to the lesion and the device will do all the job. And what is nice, and Nile was in my unit last month and we, uh, and I thank him for all the support that he gives for doing some video recording procedures just to show that what I'm really telling you is the reality that I'm not doing the procedures. Alessandra, Chiara, in this situation, they are doing an hysteroscopy. They first do the diagnostic hysteroscopy. In these cases, they are using the Betoc hysteroscope. There is a tick endometrium, in this case, on the upper part of the slides. In the lower part of the slides, Chiara develop, discover a, a polyp and then a thick endometrium. In both cases, 
they did, they switch to the true clear and then they could complete the job. Not me, but they could complete the job. So without need to put speculum, tenaculum or uh, cervical dilator, they switch to the true clear system and always in vaginoscopy. You see, they only put finger in the vaginal of the lady and following the physical rules that you have to bring the image with a zero degree scope in the middle of the screen, not at six o'clock, as when you use 30 degree for oblique view scope, they are inside the uterine cavity, no need of dilation, dilatation, and they put the blade in contact with the tissue to be removed. And you see down first polypectomy. If you think that the polyp is suspected, you can send even separate for histological analysis. And then in both cases, they did a visual DNC. Visual DNC basically is just to put the device, the blade of the device in close contact with the thick endometrium. And then the device does all the job and you don't have any more uh, frustrating histological report, inadequate specimen. Because the problem with electrosurgery and or when you use mechanical fire French instrument is that sometimes you, you cannot collect enough tissue for, from the uterine cavity in order to have a proper histological analysis. And you see that in a few seconds, not in a few minutes, you will have a complete removal of the thick endometrial tissue from the uterine cavity. You can use the visual DNC when you have a thick endometrium. When you have, you will see later, probably a complex hyperplasia with atypia. When you want to do a fertility sparing treatment, when you have chronic endometritis, and it's a really easy procedure that my fellow love to do. If I had to choose the best quality of the tissue removal device is that you have a clear and direct view all over the procedure because you cut and simultaneously aspirate all the tissue and even the blood clots, fragment mucus that are in the cavity. And these allow a significant reduction of the surgical time. This is another video that we did when Nile was attending my unit and uh, thanks even to the company who, who was with us for a couple of days. And we wanted to record real time procedures. In this case was a lady with a suspicious of polyp, the same step while coming, smiling, changing in the bathroom, this is the real time. So five minutes only for the patient to change herself. She goes on the surgical chair, a nurse, medical assistant for the vocal local. I wear the gloves. I first do the diagnostic hysteroscopy. I go inside the cavity. First, you, you need to do the, the, the diagnosis. There was a polyp here. Then my nurse has prepared the elite uh, through clear system. I have a wonderful couple of nurses that are always with us. And please let this nurse to attend the nurse course that we are going to arrange in Lisbona from the 2nd to the 5th of October during the next SG meeting. Nurses are fundamental in our ambulatory and even in the operating room activities. We see that in vaginoscopy, I go inside the cavity. There is, you will see in a few seconds, a polyp inside the uterine cavity. You have a phase in which you cannot see properly inside the cavity because as soon as you go in and out from the cavity with the diagnostic hysteroscope and then with, you go again with the true clear, but immediately when you push your pedal and you aspirate, you first activate the blade, putting this black line on the line that there is on the uh, device itself. 
And then the secret is that you have always to put the blade in contact with the tissue. So you have always to see the, the written through clear. So it means that the blade is in contact with the tissue. In this case, we are removing the polyp first. And you see here the time. Then we also do a visual DNC if we find any other area of tick endometrium. Then the patient is happy. He was awake. So the patient stands up. She thanks all the assistant. Just a couple of minutes uh, to, to feel well. Then she goes to the, the bathroom to change. Then we explain the procedures when she comes back. And look at the time. In 20 minutes, we did diagnosis and treatment of the pathology. And what is more important that the lady can come back to her familiar life, work life as an ambulatory visit. So without any need to be recovered to our institution, to waste some days or hours at work, because now currently in 2022, most women work, this is very positive. And so when you ask them, which is your dream when you have to do an operation is to come back to their family, their work as soon as possible. Of course, please, when people say yes, but the tissue removal device, I love, it's very nice. But if you have bleeding, so this is a theoretical disadvantage because if you have a proper system to dilate the uterine cavity, as for example, we have the endomat, we tried a few months ago, even this other system, the Histrolux, in order to have a proper fluid management, because in office setting, in outpatient setting, what is important is that you have to maintain an uniform and constant pressure at the minimum level, because if you increase too much the pressure, you see better, but the liquid can go through the tube and so it can cause some pain to the patient. We have already said that with the tissue removal device, you can enlarge the indication for your outpatient procedures. Probably the procedure that you will do most with the tissue removal device is the polypectomy. You just put the blade in contact with the polyp and the device will do the job by itself. So in a few seconds, in less than a couple of minutes, you can resolve the problem of the lady. You don't need to go in and out to remove the fragments, but the device will do all the job. Then I want to stress a little bit more, once more with the tissue removal device, new technique, which is the visual DNC. These are the indication that we use currently in Naples homogeneously or inhomogeneously thick endometrium with typical or atypical features up to the fertility sparing treatment of early endometrial carcinoma. Unfortunately, we have more and more women in reproductive age with complex hyperplasia with atypia or even an endometrial carcinoma. They want to preserve the uterus. We do a resection of the focal lesion in case of focal lesion, and then we combine with a visual DNC, or if you have a complete thickened endometrium, we straight away do a visual DNC. And you know that even the combination of the technology, in this case, you know, you see that I have a focal endometrial carcinoma in a lady wanting to have a pregnancy. I first remove the pathology with the mini resectoscope, then I remove the endometrium around the pathology. Then I remove the myometrium below the carcinoma. And then at the end, I switch with the tissue removal device. In this case was the Truclear Elite. And I do a visual DNC of all the endometrium that apparently was fine. But you know that you can have also a typical area in the area that macroscopically seems normal. So even the combination of technology can be the secret for the fertility sparing treatment of early endometrial carcinoma. And I hope that Paolo Casadio 
is listening at this webinar, but we are coming out with a video article showing the possibility of using the true clear system for the visual DNC for diagnosis and treatment of endometrial carcinoma, offering an easy, safe, and effective outpatient fertility sparing treatment of preneoplastic and neoplastic lesion. And please don't say that using the morsel later, you can create dissemination of malignant cell. Nothing is true. So please, if you do a procedures with the proper low pressure into the uterine cavity, you don't have any increased risk of dissemination of the cell. Last but not least, the, probably the first indication in the past, but less important in terms of frequency of the pathology is the use of tissue removal device for the retained product of conception. This was another lady that came to our unit when Nile was with us. She, she had a sonographic diagnosis of retained product of conception. So we confirm in this case with sonography that there was a two centimeter retained product of conception, but the vascularization was around and not inside the retained product of, of conception. So of course, if the vascularization is within the mass, probably the tissue removal device is not the proper device, but I would even not use electrosurgery. I would uh, wait for burning down the process of the vascularization. So in this case, I do always, as for school, diagnostic hysteroscopy. In the left coronal area, there is this 1.8, two centimeter retained product of conception. Then I put always in vaginoscopy, my tissue removal device. And mostly when you have friable tissue, the device works in a proper way because it aspirates all the fragment bloating in the uterine cavity. In this case, the lesion was in a very delicate area as it was the coronal area, but using the tissue removal device in a few minutes, you see here the time is 13 minutes at this point, we could remove the entire lesion and even the base of the lesion itself and you know that when there is a retained product of conception, this is a very adesiogenic procedure. So it's mostly in this case that you should avoid to use any kind of electricity inside the uterus in order to reduce the risk of post-surgical additions. So you see that at the end is fantastic, the view that you have, then we come out from the cavity, the patient is always awake, she's happy. Rosella is next to the patient to reassure the patient throughout the procedures. The patient goes to change herself. She asks some questions, she changes. We explain the procedures. We show on the video if she wants to ask some question and then we say the patients to come back to her routine activity. So we don't use operating room in less than 30 minutes we resolve even this challenging case. Of course, the last concept is that training is very important. Training had an evolution throughout the years. Stores, Medtronic were the first to support the GCA program that is an educational program, both for training of the psychomotor skill, both for acquiring surgical competencies Basically, you have to know that you first need to study, so theoretical knowledge, then to train your psychomotor skill in a dry lab, then you have to be certified, and then you can go in your ambulatory setting or in your operating room to do your practice. I'm very proud to show that recently we have uh, developed a, uh, a website for our GCA training and diploma center that we have in Naples. And I'm proud to say that thanks to my uh, fellows, after Clement Ferrat, we are the center who did more certification in, all over the world in the last five years. We have a lot of course 
currently, uh, in the past, we had one course every three months. Now we have one course per and one certification session per month. And thanks to uh, my uh, the tutors of my center, we can do a lot of certification setting uh, session uh, uh, every month in order to uh, train people and certify them, give the license to go in uh, in the operating uh, in the outpatient setting and even in the operating room. So I hope. I was clear with my uh, talk and I'm ready and available for all your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Attilio, for your great presentation. I think that it was really, really interesting, uh, everything. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is about the training. So how, um, how much you think is needed uh, in terms of training to be able to perform an office hysteroscopy or outpatient hysteroscopy like you are doing? We did a study when I was in London to learn hysteroscopy by Mr. Adam Magos at Royal Free Hospital. Um, and uh, that now is led by my friend Fazi. And uh, we, we have seen that if you perform 50 stroscopy uh, supervised by an expert senior doctor, then you are able to perform easy procedures in your outpatient setting. I would say that probably even less than 50 procedures are uh, enough to make you ready to do office outpatient procedures. Of course, it's important that you know your limit. It's important that you know your instrumentation. That's why theoretical knowledge are important. Then you can train yourself in a dry lab. You can train yourself with virtual simulator, and then you can go probably first in the operating room sometimes to see some movements. And then you can, when you feel confident, you can do procedures when the patient is awake. Because one of the problem is that when the patient is awake and Igor, you know, because you send me a lot of people for uh, training activities that when the patient is awake, it means that the patient can judge what is going on, can be the, the best witness of the procedures. So you cannot say in front of the patients, I've never done, I don't know how to do. You cannot ask to the patient is painful or oh, please, how can I use the to clear? Because if the patient awake understands that you are not expert, she starts to complain, she starts to be scared. Thank you. Thank you, Attilio. Uh, another question, it was uh, about the sterilizer you are using. So which kind of sterilizer are you using as chemical sterilizer? What's the name that we use in our... Uh, uh, I know the commercial name, it's Adaspor, what we use. Uh, in uh, our institution, but I mean, at the moment there are available many, many uh, chemical uh, agent that can be used for sterilization. So uh, it's parasitic acid basically that can be used for chemical sterilization. Okay, another uh, question about tips and tricks. So which tips are you suggesting to get into the internal osteo? To get uh, I mean, into the internal osteum. So what? Uh, I mean, you can use many tips and tricks. The oval profile hysteroscope allows you to align the main axis of the hysteroscope with the main axis of the internal uterine osteum. You know that in order to explain that, uh, that uh, the internal uterine osteum, we think that it is an oval, it is, uh, it is circular. Uh, this is not oval, so it's just circle one. But because of the version curve, when you bend the, when there is the version curve of the hysteroscope, of course, in this part, you see that the cervical canal appears oval, but the internal uterine ostium is not oval. It appears oval because there is a curve of version of the uterus and so it appears uh, oval. And then 
if you align the main axis of the scope with that, so you can get easily in the cavity. Then it's important that you know the six, uh, 12 o'clock rules when you use the four oblique view scope or that you have to bring the image in the middle of the screen if you use a zero degree scope, or sometimes you can use even miniaturized instruments in order to uh, stretch the external or the internal uterine ostium when you have additions or even the bipolar electrodes. But if you are going to attend the vaginoscopy learning pathway, you will see that sometimes I use my true clear even to do a sort of a blunt adhesiolysis in the internal uterine ostium. And I first put the blade into the internal uterine ostium. I cut all the fibrotic tissue and then I can get easily into the uterine cavity. Okay, thank you Attilio. Another question is how uh, will you insert true clear without cervical dilatation? How you? How you insert true clear without any kind of cervical dilatation? So, because we first do diagnostic with a four or five millimeter scope. So, I think that this is the best way even to approach cervical stenosis if they are present. Then, after you have inserted a four or five millimeter hysteroscope, I personally say, Oh, this is a very tight cervix. Please, nurse, give me the 5C. It's fiber optic technology. You see a little bit less well than with the six millimeter optic based elite true clear, but I get much easily into the uterine cavity. Or if it's quite patent, the cervix, I say to my nurse, please give me the, five, the six millimeter true clear because I can go inside the cavity. And sometimes you have to force a little bit Sometimes you can rotate the hysteroscope itself. Sometimes you need to perform a paracervical block, intracervical anesthesia. Personally, I'm not a great fan of intrauterine or intracervical anesthesia. Sometimes it can happen that the procedures can fail. And so you have to schedule the patient for inpatient approach. It's not a blame. What is a blame for me is that when you straight away refer the patient for inpatient approach, when you detect even a small pathology in the uterus or in the cervix of our lady. Okay. Another question is in your no, opinion. Think, yeah, yeah, it's I, the last one. I, I, and yeah, it's the, just the last one. So how many stereoscopes you suggested to have at the beginning when you start the clinic? It depends on our patients you plan for uh, for every session. Generally, I would recommend to start with seven to ten patients per session, and in this case, having two diagnostic or operative hysteroscope, four or five millimeter, and one or two tissue removal device allows you to manage this situation. So, because with chemical sterilization agent you can speed up the process because after 15, mi 15 minutes, every instrument that you use is ready for the next patient. Okay, thank you, Tidio. Uh, so uh, thank you for your time. And now we will move to Nile for the closure of the webinar. Thank you very much, Tidio, for the great presentation. Thank you Nile? very much. Thanks, Attilio. So what I want to talk about, and Attilio, alluded to it earlier, we are doing a, a learning pathway as part of our GYN Academy. Um, the concept for this pathway was, pathway was actually born during COVID when we had a lot of pressure on training and education. Our own pathways for Mertronic all had to be moved online where possible. And what we learned during that period was that it is possible to do parts of the pathway digitally. Obviously, we are aware that some elements of it have to be done absolutely face to face, particularly for more for more junior surgeons. That that will always have to be done face to face. But as 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 surgeons get more experience, it is possible to do to do bigger chunks of that learning online. And it, it's also from from what we've heard back from delegates is that they enjoy the online element of it. They can fit it into their, their schedules a lot more, and and they don't have to travel as much to to consume lecture content. 
So with that in mind, we have built uh, an entirely digital learning pathway. There will be elements that are face-to-face, -face, but the, the aim was to build an entirely digital one. And um, the first element of that is an e-learning course that will be housed on the, the EARCAD website. That'll be a multi-module course, and we'll have faculty from all over Europe that'll bring you through each module, and it will show you how to set up your office, uh, what equipment you should use, what pathologies can be treated, um, what type of scope should you use? Should you use food management? Those, those type of um, concerns and those types of issues are, are all covered. And I, I tell you, is or Dr. Desp or Professor Desardo is, um, is faculty on that. Then we also have the chance to do BR. Again, that would be for more junior surgeons. It will give you a chance to go through an entire procedure without being close to a patient. You get to experience it virtually and you need to do all of the actions um, for the for each procedure and you, you get to cover multiple pathologies with that as well. And then finally, we use these VUZIX classes and they enable us to do digital clinical immersions and digital proctorships. Now the digital clinical immersions are some of what we saw earlier in the presentations and that's Atilio doing the procedures. So you will join Atilio in a small group of four and he will talk you through the details of those procedures and how to perform the procedure. And then the proctorships are the follow-up on, on that, where you actually perform the procedure, you record your procedure, and you come back online and you discuss it with the faculty. Now, the pathway is flexible and it needs to be flexible based on what your experience level is. So I think the ideal pathway would be for an experience or, or a surgeon that has experience with hysteroscopy you go and you do your e-learning content, you go and do a clinical immersion, and then you do a digital partnership and, and one event each will get you there. In the event that you have less experience, then there are multiple different options. You'll go and do possibly the clinical immersion, and then you'll go straight into doing face-to-face -face clinical immersions and face-to-face -face partnerships, just because, again, as I said earlier, you need, you need that face-to-face -face contact, and, and there is no replacing that for, for less experienced surgeons. Or it's possible that you can just do multiple rounds of digital proctorships. So you come on, you get your first round of um, first round of procedures reviewed, you receive feedback from the faculty, you go back and you record five more, and that process keeps on repeating until you've reached the level of proficiency. So as you sign off from this webinar, then you will have this form pop up, and this is a registration form for the pathway. Um, so it literally takes 60 seconds to fill out or you know, between 30 and 60 seconds to fill out. It's just some small details about your experience level, your email address, so we can contact you afterwards. Um, the pathway will kick off in June um, and that'll be the e-learning content. And then after the e-learning content, that's what we'll start to, um, to push you into the different clinical immersion and partnerships afterwards. And that is it from me again i would just like to say thanks to atilio i spent a couple of days in atilio's institution and the team were very welcoming and they did everything they could to possibly get all of this um all of the material recorded and they put a lot of work into um into this webinar so so thanks atilio and thanks to your team as well thanks to all thank of you very you. much thank you all of you and, and have a nice evening. So thank you, you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.